Sasa da da Hello, my audience. Today, I will be talking to you about America's budget and where they spend their money. And a lot of it is allocated to the military, and you'd be very surprised. But first off, let me introduce you my team, which is Arno, Jordy, and Ryan. And I am Zach. So today, I just wanted to let you know that there are many countries that are trying to catch up with um, our military spending, and many countries combined are still not even to the level of which we are with spending. And basically, we want to uh, address this and just show where it could or should be spent. And um, basically, it's dispersed in various ways throughout the military. And um, basically, it's very complex. And uh, we think there should be a better balance and that taxpayer money should be spent in more productive and positive ways rather than military and war. Where defense is one thing, but we're already so far ahead. Like, for example, we spend more on military than Japan, Russia, France, India, Saudi Arabia, and China combined. And we have 19 aircraft carriers compared to the world's 12. And basically, I'm going to pass this off to our now. Okay. Hello. Ever wonder how much we use for US military spending? Being the number one world power doesn't come cheap. Our freedom is bought and paid for, not, not just with human lives, but with billions and billions of government dollars. Military spending is one area where there's no private solution to replace this pu the public purse. No single corporation or group of citizens is suffi sufficiently motivated or trustworthy enough to take financial responsibility for the cost of having a military. Adam Smith, one of the fathers of free market economics, identified the defense of society as one of the primary functions of government and justification for reasonable taxation. Basically, the government is acting on behalf of the public to ensure that the military is suffi sufficiently well resourced to defend the nation. In practice, however, defending the nation expands to defending a nation's strategic interest and the whole concept of sufficient is up for debate as other nations also broke up their military. Here is how the military is funded and what its budgets look like. The US military budget is the amount of money allocated to the Department of Defense, the DOD, and other defenses, defense agencies each, each year for military spending. It comes from the dis 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 discretionary federal budget and will equal about 773 billion for fiscal year 2017. The budget is divided up between different operations and departments within the DOD and between the various military branches. U.S. defense spending is quite significant in many ways. At one level, this goes without saying. It still totals around 700 billion annually, like I just told you, which is 100 billion above the inflation-adjusted annual average for the Cold War. U.S. military spending still accounts for 35 to 40 percent of the global total of all military spending in the world. There are three types of federal spending, mandatory, discretionary, and interest on debt. Uh, for the fiscal year 2016, 29 percent of all federal funds were discretionary, discretionary and 54 percent of these went to the military. To further emphasize just how much money is poured into the military each year, the only expenditure that surprise, surprises the military is social security. So once the military has all this money, how do they spend it among themselves? For the 2015, this is how the, budget, uh, the, budget, the military budget has been reparted between the four federally funded branches. So which is uh, the Navy received 44%, the Army received 34, 32%, the Air Force 22 and the Marine 4%. And according to the mid-session review for the fiscal year 2017, the military budget looks something like this. The Department of Defense, the DOD, received $524 billion. The Overseas Contingency Operation received $60 billion. The Department of Veterans Affairs, $75 billion. The State Department, $38 billion. Homeland Security, $40 billion. The FBI and Department of Justice, $10 billion. The National Nuclear Security Administration in the Department of Energy is 13 billion, and 15 billion are spent for the efforts against ISIS specifically. 
So the Department of Defense is the government body to which all military branches, except the Ghost Guard, belong. Here is what they do with the price of the military budget, with a piece, sorry, of the military budget. So health care, retirement, housings, and other benefits for the soldiers. They have programs within individual military branches, such as the Joint Strike Fighter Program of the, of the Air Force, the training of securities force, forces in the Middle East to help ground, hold ground against ISIS, replenish maritime security effort in Asia, improving cybersecurity, and staying involved in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So here are some facts I'm going to tell you about uh, waste of money by the U.S. military. The Defense Logistics Agency got rid of 1.2 billion excess in excess bullets in 2014. The Pentagon blew 80 million, 80 million dollars on 40 planes for Afghanistan's Air Force. Those planes, uh, the Afghans cannot fly or maintain them. Overall waste in Afghanistan have been estimated at 17 billion dollars. And uh, a report by the Defense Department Inspector General last summer found that the Army made 2.8 trillion worth of wrongful adjustments to, ac to accounting entries in one quarter alone. In 2015, and 6.5 trillion for the year. The Army lacked receipts and invoice to support those numbers or simply made them up. Though there are many nations that have a standing military but an unreliable public infrastructure from hospital to roads to school. North Korea is an extreme example of what an unrelenting focus on military spending can do to the standard living of the general population. So I now let Jordi tell you the rest. So if we spend this much on our nation's defense budget, one has to wonder where else could we put it? These are the numbers for the 2015 discretionary budget. However, for the 2017 discretionary budget, it hasn't gotten much better. The budget has increased to $1.15 trillion, er, trillion dollars as opposed to $1.11 trillion. And we still spend 54% of that on military. However, that number has increased to $622.6 billion spent on our military. So if we could move it elsewhere, Let's run with an idea that we take $100 billion from the military budget, which is 16% of that military budget, or just 8% of our total discretionary budget. Now, most of the numbers that I'm going to be getting here are from uh, former President Barack Obama's proposed uh, discretionary budget for the fiscal year of 2017. Um, there are lots of possible departments that could use this money. However, uh, for the purposes of this speech, we're going to look at how it could be used um, in the departments that help with unemployment, social security, and transportation. Part of our nation's infrastructure involves supporting members of our community when they need it most. And social security is what helps do this. Now, it's a hot button issue, but whether you um, believe that the government should be supporting um, our members, it is undeniable that we still spend a significant chunk of change on our social security programs. One of, the, one of the departments that handles Social Security is the Department of Labor. As of the 2017 fiscal year, uh, we have allotted $31.7 billion, or 3% of the total budget to the Department of Labor. The Department of Labor handles um, efforts such as finding post-combat employment for veterans and sudden unemployment of um, our nation's citizens, whether they are... they. They suddenly find themselves laid off or they're seasonal. Um, but if we gave this hypothetical $100 billion to the Department of Labor, they could increase these and we would or increase these efforts and we would see lower numbers of unemployment. One of the other departments that handles Social Security issues um, is the Department of Health and Human Services. Currently, the Department of Health and Human Services receives $58.6 billion, or 5% of the total budget from our government. Now, the Department of Health and Human Services has a laundry list of uh, associations underneath them, which um, include but are not limited to the Food and Drug Association, the Center for Disease Control, the Administration of Children and Families, and the Center for Medicare and Medicaid. These programs um, work to ensure that we have um, 
or they, they handle tasks such as regulating chemicals used in medications, providing affordable vaccinations for diseases like the flu and measles, helping impoverished families feed their children through programs like SNAP, and providing the elderly and disabled with health care when they would be um, turned away by private companies. If they had this hypothetical $100 billion, they would be able to expand all of these programs as they deem necessary, as well as any other programs under their own jurisdiction. Another aspect of our infrastructure that could use help is the actual physical network of highways and roadways that connect the nation's cities together. All of this is maintained by the Department of Transportation, who currently receive $24.7 billion, or 2% of the total budget. Now, if you've lived in rural Minnesota long enough, I'm sure you've noticed that there are always roads that need help. Even interstates and freeways aren't able to be kept in the best of conditions simply because the Department of Transportation is unable to keep up with all the necessary road work. If they were given this $100 billion that we would supposedly take from the military budget, their budget would quadruple, and they, would, they might be able to get more equipment and manpower to work on repairing the roads, or they would be able to implement public transportation outside of major metropolitan areas. Um, currently, we do have uh, transportation systems in cities like Minneapolis and St. Paul, New York, Chicago. However, we are miles behind any other countries with transportation systems such as France, the Netherlands, and the UK. While it is necessary to note that we are a much larger landmass than any of these countries, if they were to have this $100 billion, it would be able to trickle down into the state departments and we would be able to expand our transportation so it, would, it might be easier to get a bus from St. Cloud to Minneapolis. So now I'm, these are all issues that the government could solve by, sh by shifting our money around. But I'm going to pass it off to Ryan Stout, who will let us know what we can do to help. Thank you, Jordan. Um, before the curtain comes down on the speech, I would like to remind you that we are not military haters or not supporters of the US military. I can speak for the entire group in this aspect that all of us are grateful for the time and the services our veterans have committed to the country that, in which we live and us, those who live in this country peacefully. But now is a time of interconnectivity between the U.S., different countries, and just more people in different cultures in general. There is less of a need nowadays for a need of war and militaristic actions, and more of a, foc a need to focus on securing our own future. To put it in baseball terms, we need to focus more on the home game than on the away game. Our own country needs to be fixed before we start fixing others. All the things we have presented to you today seemed too huge to tackle. And you would be right, tackling a $622 billion infrastructure is a bit much. But small changes on the local and state levels can help us take steps in the right direction. And steps towards balancing and reprioritizing the uh, nation's spending. This will not be an easy or a short task. This would be a task lasting longer than our lifetime or even our children's lifetime. I ask all of you as adults legal voters to get up and take action for your home. During the next election, go out and vote. Find a candidate that is supportive of your local government and the federal government as a whole. If there's something in your community that needs changing, start a petition or con contact your congressman. Let your voice be heard. It's these small steps that will lead to a better future. Thank you for your time, and we will now all be taking questions. <laughs> Thank you. So, quick question. Why do you think the U.S. spends so much in this way? I think the U.S. is spending so much on the military because it's good for the wealth, the 1% economy, and that it's boosting the American America's economy in general, because wartime makes money. Okay. 
the the issue with that is being um, excuse me <coughs> is that we have put so much of our budget into our Department of Defense when we were in conflicts and in wartime and we didn't adjust for getting into peacetime. We continued to put the same amount of money into our Department of Defense when it wasn't of dire need at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. You guys answered some of the needs too, so it's good. <laughs> One of the points that I found was that, oh, people are always arguing, oh, we're in a war right now, a war on terror. And to that I say, those are isolated attacks from an enemy that doesn't necessarily have a cause. And it's what a lot of people call a loud minority and just causes attention and the media is playing off of these and only focusing on those isolated incidents. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, there is a last question, I guess. You mentioned um, what people can do, right? Mm -hmm. Petitions, write to your local representatives, um, vote. Um, how, hmm. I'm thinking about the people that actually, you know, have maybe two jobs, three jobs, don't really have those resources to do that. How can we, is there other ways to ensure that we hear from the people that are most affected by not having the money spent on certain things? So no. for example, if you don't have a car, you need to go vote, you need to register, mm -hmm. how do you deal with those issues? One of the ways that I feel like people could definitely start getting their voices out there is even if somebody is living in poverty these days, it's very likely that they will have some form of social media. Mm -hmm. And it's important that um, our legislators look at what people are saying on social media about what changes they need to see. Um, I know for a fact one of uh, a representative from my home district, uh, he has an active social media account and is always interacting with the people that he represents. Um, and as such, we get to see changes in our district that are what people are saying. But the thing is, some people discredit social media, but it's a way to get your voice heard if you can't physically be where you need to be. Okay. Cool. Thank you for your time. Thank you very Thank much. You. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, is that the official recording you have? Mm -hmm. Yes.